everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Dave Hendrickson. Hi Dave. Hi Joanna. I'm really delighted to be here. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. Now, just a little introduction. Dave is an award-winning non-fiction and sports writer, as well as an award-winning short story writer and novelist. He really is multi-talented. And his latest book is How to Get Your Book into Schools and Double Your Income with Volume Sales. And for the people on the video, I think you have the book there, don't you, Dave? Yes, I do. I'll put it in front of my face. That will improve all all <laughs> video aspects. So. Oh, no, that's fantastic. And um, it's so interesting. You have a really interesting background. Of course, I've met you in person. We've been in the, in Oregon uh, together on writing workshops. But I, I, when I started looking at your bio, I was, I was just surprised by all these things you've done. So tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing, a little potted history. Well, I... I was actually, when I was growing up, everything was about science and mathematics and technology, and that's the direction I went into. So I didn't get bitten by the writing bug until I was about 20. A friend lent me a book of short stories by Harlan Ellison. I read the very first one, and I said, that's what I want to do with my life. And I promptly sat down to write my first story. I got two paragraphs into it. I looked at it and realized how horrible it was. Uh, and even though it felt powerful to be doing the writing, uh, somebody came up behind me and said, oh, so what's that that you're writing? And I kind of dove on it like it was a grenade about to go off because initially I was just pretty terrible. So it took me quite some time before I, I really started having any success at all with fiction. I actually had a lot of success with nonfiction, especially sports writing earlier on. I, I was winning awards was becoming a, a reasonably big fish in the small pond of, of college hockey, uh, but my passion was fiction. And so I finally got in the right direction, uh, got hooked up with people like uh, Chris and Dean, and uh, Gene Cavellis was, was very instrumental in, in helping me believe that I actually had some talent. And so uh, things are going quite well now, but it took a long time to get here. Mm, but uh, you you have still have a day job, right, as well? Uh, yes, I do. I, in fact, I have a couple day jobs. I, I write software. So if you get an ultrasound by the company that produces the ultrasound machines, I write the software in there so that you might feel good about that or you might <laughs> feel scared about it. Uh, I also teach at a couple colleges in the evening part time. And then I, do, I still do the college hockey writing from essentially October through uh, through April. And I managed to go and fit some fiction writing time in there because it's a passion. I, I, I always kind of roll my eyes a little bit when people say, oh, I just don't have time. You have to force the time. And so I, I do have a busy schedule, but I've got the most amazing supportive wife in the universe. And, uh, and that, that, helps, uh, that helps as well. Yeah, it's really good to hear. And I think it's so important to, to for people to know about all these different things that you do and that all of us do, that there's this myth that to be a full-time writer means that you only write like the one thing, like you only write short stories or you only write novels, but you, write, you do all these things. So, you know, that that's fantastic. So let's get into your book, which um, how to get your book into schools. Now, let's just be clear what type of book you're talking about and what kind of schools, because those, you you know, words are quite big. So for this interview, what, what type of books, what kind of schools? Okay, if I can answer the second question first, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the schools, there's actually all kinds of variability that you can have there. I specifically talk about American high schools because that's where my own personal experience lies. But uh, you can apply this to middle grade, you can apply this to colleges, and you can even apply it to corporations. One person who's read the book has uh, said, okay, I'm going to see if I can go and use some of these techniques to try to get my nonfiction book into corporations. So it really can go in, and uh, have the full gamut of possibilities. But again, I target high schools because that's where my experience is, and I think that's where the greatest opportunities are because a lot of high schools have summertime required reading. Sometimes it's it's a list that students can pick from. Sometimes schools will uh, adopt a book that everybody in the school winds up reading, an all-school read. And that's where you can really hit a home run as a, as a writer. Now, in terms of what type of book, um, 
you know, young adult is clearly the sweet spot. There are certain genres that are obviously not going to be appropriate for schools. But <clears throat> young adult has uh, really three advantages. First of all, schools are going to be typically sensitive about extreme language, uh, extreme sexual situations, and young adult although there certainly are edgier, edgier books, young adult will tend to have fewer problematic um, language issues and fewer problematic uh, sexual issues. Principals are dealing with parents screaming at them all the time, and they're not exactly uh, accepting of, well, let me just add more problems to my, uh, to my plate. <laughs> so they are going to be, uh, you know, those are going to be issues. The other thing is that because young adult, the protagonists and most of the characters are teenagers, high school students immediately relate to those type of characters. And so young adult is really the sweet spot. And, you know, realistically speaking, um, realistic fiction is easier than, say, for example, young adult fantasy. But I think with the uh, we've all seen with what's happened with Harry Potter, mm. that, uh, that there's a lot more accepting of of uh, fantasy titles than realistic titles. But the, the nice thing is that you, uh, with what I talk about in terms of doing a direct mail opportunity, if you have a book that you feel is a little bit more of a long shot, you can risk less, to, less of your money. I like to think of it as being investing. But mm -hmm. if, if you can design your own materials, you can get the cost down to less than a dollar per school. And so if you have what you feel is a long shot, well, are you willing to risk $25 to go and target 25 schools? Well, you know, again, you, you can go and pick your own choice in terms of what size of a campaign you want. Mm. And I think it's really important because, uh, you know, we're talking about volume sales, which is something I'm really interested in. We've had Honoré Corda on before, and she does volume sales for lawyers with nonfiction. So this is a business model that I find really interesting. And, a lot, you know, a lot of people do this. And having just come off London Book Fair, lots of people doing volume sales, and these figures never hit the Amazon bestseller list. Like, the books you're selling into schools, they don't count towards your Amazon ranking, but they put money in the bank, which is what you're saying. So um, I wanted to ask you more specifically, what makes your book Offside a great book for schools? So why did they want it? So that people can kind of say, put themselves in the mind of, like you say, the principal or the teacher or the librarian or whoever's, you know, buying. Okay. Um, I, I've, I've actually targeted two of my titles, Offside and also Cracking the Ice. They're both set in the 60s during the height of America's civil rights struggle. And so that is a historical era that schools are interested in. But getting back to Offside, in particular, some of the things that that book talks about, and I didn't set out to go and, oh, let me write a book that will appeal to schools. I hadn't even considered that. But it deals with issues of bullying. It deals with issues of a dysfunctional family or a borderline dysfunctional family. It deals with issues of, you know, friendship, of being all alone or having friends that really matter. And and uh, so those are topics that really matter a lot to uh, to teachers and schools, and they really relate to, to students. And so for certain titles, you know, if, if you have themes that really resonate for a school, that can make a powerful selling argument. Mm. And I think it's funny you mentioned Harry Potter because, of course, it, it huge book, um, but it was also burned by some uh, American schools, uh, uh, Christian, ultra orthodox, I guess, Christian, however we call them, for for yeah. having magic in. So, you know, definitely thinking about the schools you're targeting with what what kind of things. But as you say, uh, your um, the the race theme, sports, I think, is always a good thing, isn't it? And bullying yeah. and that type of thing. So, yeah. yeah really Really interesting. Yeah, it, it you know I, I mentioned those themes, but and and again because it was in the civil rights uh, era, race was an even bigger issue. Race continues to be an issue, so it's an ongoing topic. But the other thing is that in addition to it's not a preachy book at all. It, these are themes that are important to to teachers. But teachers also felt you know this is a book that there's a lot of sports in it. Mm -hmm. I'll say American football because uh, what what I <laughs> call soccer. football isn't what you call <laughs> football, uh, and so um, it. it it has a lot of American football in it, and there are a lot of exciting scenes. It's a page turner, and so it's not the kind of book that a student is going to look at and say, 
oh my goodness, this is this is like James Boring. Joyce Ulysses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it it is something that the, and and it's a very charismatic character. It's a character that that kids can relate to, and so as a result, uh, I think character is what fiction ultimately is all about. So it's a character that's a, a winning character that, that really people uh, identify with. And some of the situations of what he has to deal with really relate to students. So I'm really interested. We've decided that this is the book we're going to pitch. We think it's appropriate. We've honed down the themes and everything. So how do you then identify the decision makers at schools and get books into their hands? And is there any kind of timing that people need to consider? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. One of the things when I first started thinking about this, I, I had my first success just purely based on word of mouth. And one person had to love it. They had to recommend it to another person who loved it. And, you know, the chain had, was really pretty intimidating. So I was, I was very fortunate in that respect. So I figured now I'm going to be proactive. So I started looking on the Internet. And I'm saying, oh, it's going to take me forever to go and compile all this information about schools. Now, if somebody is looking just to go and say, for example, target the schools in their community, then they can do something like that and it's a reasonable amount of time. But I wanted to target a larger number of schools. And so if you're going to do that, I found a, a resource uh, on the internet. It's, uh, I'll tell people, it's, you don't have to buy my book to get it. It's <laughs> highschools.com. There's a hyphen in there. So high-schools.com. And for $50, you can get a database of all of the American private and public schools. It's, it's about a five or six year old uh, database. <clears throat> and so there, there will be uh, the occasional change of address or, or whatever. But for me, $50, my time is worth a whole lot more than $50. Uh, I've talked about my schedule. I, I wanna be able to go and if I'm, if I'm gonna be sending out uh, you know, 300 uh, pieces of mail to 300 different schools, I don't want to have to go and, and research all those. It'll take me forever. So I can completely get that. It lists everything from what the enrollment is to uh, it, it gives all the information except for an email address. You can't go and start becoming an email spammer. You're going to have to go and do this the, the old fashioned way through, uh, through snail mail. Uh, but they give you all the information. So you can go and say, OK, well, I'm going to target the larger schools first or I'm going to target schools in certain communities because I feel that this will be uh, ideal. And by, by doing that, then that makes it so you can put it in the hands of the decision makers. Now, for a novel, I figure it's typically going to be an English department that is going to be uh, at least the starting point for, uh, for summertime recommended reading. So I initially was putting it, uh, uh, put it, listing it for the English language arts department. But then I realized that, well, if a school doesn't have an English language arts department, it might go to the language department. And I really mm -hmm. wanted to go to English. So I just put it uh, to English department and it always gets routed to the uh, to the appropriate, usually the head of the English department, who's the key decision, decision maker that I want to go and talk to. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think um, the actual physical mail is probably a better option these days because everyone's got all these emails. And from what I've heard from teachers these days, you know, they're getting emails and texts from parents all the time. And, yeah. you know, having a physical something um, will remind them about your book. So tell us, like you mentioned, uh, you mentioned 300 schools there. You mentioned direct mail at less than a dollar per school. So tell us, what were you putting in an envelope like you know did you do postcards like what did you put and send to them yeah i i did a two-page um, mailer i did a two-page file uh flyer that i put together um i tried to make it as attractive as possible and actually people can go to uh, my publishing website and actually look at the at that material because that wasn't the kind of thing that i could actually include in my book and have the format be right because you know it, I needed eight and a half by eleven format and that wasn't going to work in my book so you can go to go to my uh, go to pentucketpublishing.com or I've shortened it pentpub p e n t p u b dot com and you can go and see the materials there you can also see, see them uh, uh, some other materials as well that I uh, uh, that I I will talk about but. But basically, I had one page that's about offside and one page about cracking the ice. And I uh, put that together, put it into an envelope with, uh, with labels and all that. And um, now, I, I made it so it was a color 
you know, you want it to be visually attractive because people get junk mail all the time. You want it to be something that's visually arresting and also will capture the, the teacher's attention. So I did that. I also found a, a resource online to go and get cheaper, uh, cheaper color reproductions than going to the local Staples. I went to Staples and nearly fell over in shock at what, what it was going to cost me. But uh, um, I, 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 I went to print printdirtcheap.com and got a, a great deal. And so that made it so that I could have a two-page flyer. Um, I could contact uh, these schools and I could, uh, I, could, I could really see what my chances were. Direct mail is not something that you, you're not going to get a huge percentage return. Uh, typically, direct mail is considered, well, if you get one to two percent return, you're, you're doing good. Well, uh, what I do is I have the, st uh, I have the teachers go and uh, either email me or else fill out a contact form on the website. And then as a result, I will then get them a preview copy of either either the books that they choose. Yeah, and that's an important point. You're not so you're not sending the book. So even though you are doing um, color printing, you're not sending a book. So it's not the postage itself is not too expensive. And we're going to come back to you cash flow and everything in a minute. But you did mention uh, Pentucket. Uh, publishing your your publishing company yes. is it important do you think to have an imprint to have a name that is not your name because let's face it English teachers in schools are probably not really up to speed on how cool being indie is <laughs> <laughs> yes you and I both believe in being indie we we love it, it it's it's great but you know the the reality is is that there's still going to be a lot of people who view it in a negative fashion and uh you know <laughs> we all know that uh that it, it isn't an indication of quality but you need to go and make a professional uh impression you need to go and and look as though you're right up there with the new york pu publishers and so um i think you want to have a publishing unit uh, I, I, yes, I know that Simon and Schuster was originally formed by a guy named, uh, whose last name was Simon and a guy whose last name was Schuster. But these days, uh, you know, I think there, there is the, there are negatives associated with being indie in some people's eyes. So you want to look pub, you want to look, uh, professional, you want to have a professional website. And also if you've done a doing business as you'll have a professional, uh, you'll have an imprint for a checking account. That's actually important. One of the things I found out, and I already had it, but one of the things that I found out was that the very first school I dealt with, one of their requirements was if they were going to be using a grant to go and buy these, uh, buy these copies of the, of the book, it had, the check had to be made out to a company, not to a person. Mm -hmm. And so if you said, well, I don't really need to go and, and form a, uh, a company. It's not like you have to form a corporation. Just uh, do a doing business as uh, and have your own imprint, have a professional looking website. And then when you're communicating with, um, with, the, with the schools, I have it set up so that um, the email account that I use to communicate with schools, the name that goes out, I, I don't want to use Hendrickson, even though, my, even though Pentucket Publishing only publishes David H. Hendrickson and D. H. Hendrickson. Do you think they're the same person? They just might be. Uh, so if somebody looks at it closely, they're going to go and put two and two together. But I do make it so that uh, I use my wife's maiden name for any communication to the school. So and and that's actually I'm not being deceptive there. She helps me in every possible way. So it's 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 not being deceptive, but I'm using her maiden name. So it isn't just like, oh, this is just a small potatoes, one man, one man show, even though I am kind of small potatoes and on a one man show. So I, so having, having an email account, having a website and, and, and most, most website hosting places will provide you automatically with the email account. So that, that usually goes along with a, with a package. But also have that checking account that you've set up in the publishing name. It's um, just a few a few things there. Um, the doing business as I've had Helen Sedwick on the show talking about, but you know, setting up a business in the U.S. Um, for for anyone who was wondering what you were talking about there. Um, and then uh, the email thing, I use G Suite, uh, so it's Google Mail, um, because at the beginning I just had it with my hosting service, and then when you know 
very occasionally websites go down, right? And if your email is, a, is attached to your hosting service, uh, you lose your email at the same time as your website, which can be a nightmare when you're trying to fix your, you know, things are going wrong with your website. So I have since moved hosting services, but also moved my email to G Suite um, or Google business tools so that um, they, they're separate. So just a little tip for people from my opinion on, on the business side, but you're right. And you can set up all these different um, emails and things that still go through your domain. So I think that's a really good idea. And one of the reasons I set up Curl Up Press is from coming to Oregon and, and listening to Chris and Dean. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, some of those people have said, oh, this is amazing. I would like to order your book. So how are you sorting out your books at a discount and pricing them correctly? Um, and what services do you use uh, for that as well as what markup, etc.? Okay, yeah, that really comes down to three factors. It comes down to, well, what is the list price of your book? What is the discount you can offer? And then what is the cost? And I actually spend quite a bit of time in the book talking about cost. Mm -hmm. Everything kind of revolves around that. There are things you can do to reduce your cost that make it so that it's better for your bottom line or better for the discount that you can offer. For example, one of the most basic things that you can do is you can reduce the page count in your in your book when i had first produced or when my when my wonderful designer dale dermatis uh first produced offside it was a 302 page book it's a little bit long for young adult but i'm i guess i'm just verbose that's about that's about how long i tend to go and but what i went to her and i said well what can we do to go and cut down on the uh on the page count because that can be important to go and and if you're talking about volume sales that can be really significant. Well, there were a couple really easy things to do. First of all, we had originally laid out the book so that if a chapter started on an odd numbered page, it was, if a chapter was on the right side, we would put a blank page on the left side. Well, that's not mandatory. New York publishers do it that way sometimes. They don't do it that way other times. So it's not at all unprofessional to do away with that blank page. Mm -hmm. So we did away with that blank page. We also, we also went and looked at the start of a chapter. We started that, we were starting that a little further down the, the page than was really necessary. So we just moved that up a little bit. And there were a couple other little tweaks. The book still looks uh, every bit as amazing as before. It looks absolutely professional, absolutely readable. You don't want to go and just say, oh, let me squeeze it down to a font size mm. of eight. Uh, yeah. Because te teenagers all they're, they're not yet they're not yet having problems reading like like their adult uh, <laughs> teachers. If if you do that, you know teachers are just going to throw the book out the window. So you still need to be absolutely um, uh, absolutely professional and absolutely attractive. But by doing just a few things, and again these were these are uh, we I sh I put a before and after up on the website. Um, by doing just those few things, we were able to drop it down from 302 pages to 240. Wow. What that did, that, that, I, I, I almost fell off the chair. I had to go and flip through to make sure it was did all something wet. get missed. <laughs> you know? So it still had every single last word. It still looked terrific. But when you looked at it, the cost per book was 74 cents less cost per book. Wow. So if you if you hit it big, if you sell a uh, thousand copies to a school, you've re you've reduced your cost by seven hundred and forty dollars. That's that's astounding. Another thing you can do for cost, if you if you get your purchase order soon enough so that you've got enough time to go and deliver the the books to the school well before, say, for example, their summer vacation, you don't you don't want to be in a position where you know, the books arrive the day after the school goes on summer vacation and you're there, they're like, oh, what do I do now? Do I go, do I go to the school and I hand deliver them out to their individual, uh, 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 you know, locations? Well, obviously that's not going to work. You can't cut it too close. But if, if you've got enough time, one of the things that you can reduce cost on is, first of all, shipping costs. There's different choices of shipping that vary quite a bit in terms of what the cost is. More to the point, there are some really significant volume discounts that are available if you are selling enough of the uh, enough. So, mm -hmm. for example, at Ingram Spark, uh, if you are selling at least 750 copies, 
their volume discount is astounding to the point where here, here's the here's the point where I'll, I'll just make the make it pretty easy to understand. If you use the volume discounting uh, approach, you can get almost 1,300 copies for less than 700 copies. Wow. Uh, I'm not talking about less cost per book. Mm. I'm talking about the other 600 copies are free. <laughs> That's so amazing. It, it, it is amazing. <laughs> um, now. You, but you do have to, what they do is they go through a, a third party uh, entity, and so you need to go and provide at least an extra 10 business days. So if you're tight to the summer deadline, you can't do that. Mm. Or, if, uh, or if you just don't, if, you're, if your sale is a 500 copies, it's, it's not going to qualify. But there are options that you have to drive the cost down uh, if you have enough time, if you've planned enough time. And so if you've gotten the information to the, to the teachers uh, in enough time, those are options that you have available. So what I consider to be the ideal times to send out these, uh, these flyers to the teachers is actually October and November, I think, is the absolute best time. Right at the beginning of September, there's so much flurry of activity with things going on with a new school year. And it might, teachers might be a little bit flustered at that point. October and November gives them time to go and look at your flyer. You, uh, you know, get interested, request a copy, give it, give a chance to read it, and then go through all the different uh, approaches that are necessary to get approval through uh, through the school department and, and so on. Uh, January also can can work, but it's getting a little bit tight there. If if there's if the bureaucracy is turning slowly, then pretty much anything after January, you're 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 going to be in a position where you you're tight for that school year. Now, the having said that, I still think there are opportunities to go and send out flyers later on in the year. That will be those flyers will go out to the teachers. They'll request a book and they'll read it during their summer vacation. So you'll be, but your payoff will be the following year because there just isn't enough time to get those books into the uh, into the students' hands. However, th there's also, you know, I, I've talked a lot about the bulk sales. Students can also, or schools can also choose to go and just put your book on a recommended reading list. They don't go and say, okay, we're buying a thousand copies to give to all of our students. They're going to say, well, we really like this book, but the way we do it is we have a list of 10 acceptable titles and the student picks the one or two that they're going to go and read in the summer. So in a case like that, you're not going to be sending the, the copies of the books to the school. The students are going to be buying them individually. So in that case, some of the financial issues or some of the financial risks that you might have go away. The big payoff, it, the payoff isn't as big, but you will see your, your sales uh, spike up to be sure. Wow, this is so interesting. I love, I love, love, love this business model. Um, you know, on the nonfiction side again, the uh, Who Moved My Cheese, um, that book sold bazillions to corporate <laughs> America. I mean, yep. and still is on the bestseller list because they started out like doing these bulk sales. And what you're describing is exactly the same, you know, from your one man um, and woman <laughs> uh, shop. But it's yep. so interesting because, of course, you have to be super organized to do this. Like, I'm not surprised really that you're a programmer as well, because to me, this is like, a, you know, a spread, you must have a spreadsheet with, with all this sort of organization on. And right. so let's just, uh, you know, and, and that's what makes me feel a little bit, now, I, I can do stuff like this, but this is like whole magnitudes of organization. So how do you not go bankrupt? Because obviously, <laughs> like you've mentioned, purchase order, um, like, when do you have to pay to print the books? And then when do you get the money? Like, how can people not lose everything? <laughs> yes. That, and that's a really important thing. And in fact, the chapter in that in the book that I talk about this, I even put in the headline, do not skip this chapter, yeah. <laughs> because it, it talks about the, the dangers of too much success. Is there such thing as too much success? Mm. If you send out a gigantic mailing and you you, you hit what seems to be the pot of gold and the uh, multiple schools want to go and buy a bajillion copies. The thing that you have to be aware of is that there, you, you're going to have some cash flow issues um, because the schools aren't just going to go and give you the money up front. That isn't mm -hmm. how they work. They work according to purchase orders. Uh, it would be all too easy for scammers to go and say, oh, well, 
give me the cash and I'll deliver on whatever the product is. And so schools just don't work that way. They give you a purchase order. And and I should point out, purchase orders to you know a governmental agency like a public school are considered in the industry about as, as safe as you can get. You don't want to go, and, to, uh, and this is my own personal opinion, but you don't want to go and take a purchase order from a bookstore uh, or, or a corporation because bookstores and corporations go out of business all the time. I know one publishing entity that lost a quarter million dollars of product, not not profit, but a quarter million dollars of cost to them when a bookstore chain went out of business. Mm. And so they had done a purchase order. That was uh, a quarter million dollar hit to them. Wow. Well, you, you can't, you can't, well, maybe I can't take it. Maybe you can. No, you can I can't take, take it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could take it, but I can't. <laughs> so, so don't do this with bookstores. I love bookstores, but, but any anything other than a public governmental agency, you really need to go and get cash up front. But with books, uh, but with uh, schools, they're going to give you a purchase order. At the time you get the purchase order, you'll order the books. You're going to be paying CreateSpace or Ingram Spark for those books. Presumably, you're going to be telling them to drop ship those at the uh, at the school's location, and then at that point, you know you'll invoice the school, and you can put on that invoice. Terms due in 30 days, but governments don't work that way. Things grind slowly with governments. They just, they look at that and say, oh, yeah, yeah, 30 days. And you can even put there, you know, if you want to, you can go and say, you know, beyond that, a 1% service charge. Well, good luck collecting that. It's just not going to happen. So, and in fact, when, when it got to the point where it was close to two months with my very first uh, situation, I had my wife go and, and just make a delicate inquiry because she actually has some experience in that, in that area. And they said, oh, yeah, yes, the, uh, the books to the high school. Yeah, we're going to be talking about that in, in the budget meeting in uh, two weeks from now. And it's, it's on the agenda. So it's not like, oh, yeah, well, oh, geez, we forgot to go and send you the check. It was now almost two months, and they were. It was on the agenda. So it, it took roughly three months. Now, you might go and say, "Well, three months." Well, that was nine thousand dollars out of my pocket for three months. Mm -hmm. And so, not everybody is in a position to go and and handle that. And so, if you hit it big with multiple schools, you just need to be aware of what you're potentially dealing with. So you'll need to go and, and say, for example, one of the things I talk about is potentially you can set up with your bank. Maybe they can give you a line of credit when on the on the purchase order mm. because a purchase order with uh, a governmental agency should be something that a, a bank could uh, could work with. Or you get a loan on your 401k, or your uh, or you go to you know Uncle Fred and Aunt Louise and say, I'll even laugh at your jokes when we get together next time if you can just float me this nine thousand dollars. Whatever the case, you just need to go and have a plan in place for what you're going to do if you hit it big, uh, and how you're going to handle that cash flow because there's going to be a time period between when you make that order and when you actually get the check. It's a wonderful time when you actually get the check. But and, and it will arrive, um, you know, for a for a public institution like that. But um, governments don't go out of business often. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so so it, it, it is it is something that you're not going to be feeling as though you're going to be left out in the cold. But there is going to be a stretch there where, where times will be tight. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I mean, I, I was just remembering then when I was an IT contractor and, you know, you would be phoning the accounts payable and I worked in accounts payable <laughs> systems and I still you know obviously I couldn't get my own stuff through but it was you know the the amount that you have to sort out on that side so I want people to be aware of that and obviously we're not giving financial advice and we're not advising anyone on anything but this is so important this understanding the cash flow it's not I mean in a way it's quite quite similar in a way to paid ads um, you know, you pay for an ad up front and then 90 days, 60, 90 days later, you get the book sales revenue. Right. So yep. there's sort of what, you know, I know authors have struggled with the money that goes to Facebook before, you know, they get the money back from their right. book sales. So I think this idea of cash flow is so important for people to understand. But let's just circle round because I know I can hear my audience in my head going, <laughs> what? This is crazy. Like, what are you doing? So, Dave, is it worth it? Like, what the hell's going on here? Is it worth, like, what is the rewarding side of it? 
Uh, well, I, th there are multiple things that are rewarding. First of all, um, it can be a, a very, very nice payday for you. You know, again, I talked about having to wait for it, but if you if you handle the cost of your book and making for an attractive uh, discount for the school, it's it's an attractive payday. Second of all, you have just gone and touched a good number of readers who, if they like your book, now, granted, some of those may be reluctant readers, and they're never going to read another book that a teacher doesn't force them to, to read ever again. But there are a lot of other avid readers who now are going and saying, oh, what other stuff by this person can I read? Uh, and in fact, you know, I encountered that when I went and spoke uh, at, a, at a school. The, you know, I, I'm hearing a, a girl behind and say, I, um, I want to order your cop Cracking the Ice book. And so uh, you're, you're, you're attracting other readers and readers who are going to be along, uh, around a long time. The other thing is that, you know, first of all, it, it can be really, really gratifying to go and speak at a school. You may get an, inter, uh, uh, an offer to go and speak at the school. Sometimes if you're a big enough name, there'll be an honorarium uh, um, applied to it. For me, I, I just, I feel that there's a massive benefit to talking to students and, and making a difference in their life. I think that this is one of the things that just as a personal goal of mine, if I can make a difference in these kids' lives, it's it's an awesome thing, and I must admit there's a there's an ego uh, associated with it as well. When I went and uh, stood up in front of Lynn English High School, and the ovation that they gave me was astounding. There were kids off on one side who were chanting the title "Offside, Offside," <laughs> and then afterwards, um, the the principal had said, "Would you be willing to sign copies of, of your book?" <laughs> They're like, "Well." <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> hand, hand me a pen. And I signed hundreds of copies of my book. I signed agenda books. I signed post-it notes for those kids who'd forgotten their copy. Aww. I signed backpacks. And the point that made me feel like an absolute rock star was somebody had a Sharpie and over a dozen kids pulled up their sleeves and said, can you sign my arm? Oh. So, so there, there was an absolute ego associated with that. It, you know, and for somebody who'd really struggled for a long time to get, get going with a fiction, uh, that was a real, uh, you know, a real reinforcement of things. So, you know, you can get a really nice payday. You can really attract a new reader base. You can go and have speaking opportunities, but you can also make a difference in young people's lives. And this is the, a really fragile moment for them. If you can make a difference, that's an awesome thing. Oh, everyone's gonna cry now. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, and I think this is really important because we all, if you only were writing for the money, it just wouldn't be, you know, this is not the reason you go into schools. I mean, like you've described, there's a lot of hard work involved, but it, yep. it, it's obviously now my goal to have to sign on someone's arm with a Sharpie. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I feel like I, I can, I can die happy now. There's something I've achieved that you haven't. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I, I wait, didn't think we, that was possible. Oh, we are going to get to that now. Uh, first of all, before I ask you this uh, next question, um, so the book is uh, show us the book again. How to get your book into schools and double your income with volume sales. It is by David H. Hendrickson. Sorry, yeah. I introduced you as Dave. Yeah. Uh, well. <laughs> You know, actually, most people know of me as Dave. The only person who calls me David is my mother when she's upset with me. So, so you're you're in, okay. right in there with everybody. But but David just seemed to be a little bit more very serious, author yes. resonant. It you is. know, so. so I want so um, in terms of what you've done that I haven't. Okay, you are an award-winning short story writer, which is amazing. And we've had short story writers on the show, and you're a novelist. But you also, and I thought this was a title on your site, 1,500 <laughs> works of non-fiction, 1,500. Yep. Is this a typo yeah. and what is this about? And, and mainly <laughs> the question is, what lessons did, have you brought from non-fiction into your fiction side? Yeah, it, it's not a typo. <laughs> uh, but, but thank You're you for thinking that that might You're be a bot, the case. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, for, for several decades now, in addition to writing software and, and teaching, I've been, I've been intensely covering college hockey. And in fact, for the longest time, when my fiction was going absolutely nowhere, um, I, I would I'd be so frustrated 
I couldn't give my stories away. And people would go and say, well, you're winning awards for your for your sports writing. You're you're attracting this big following. Um, my daughter went to, to a visit to uh, to Washington, D.C., and her congressional representative said, oh, are you are you related to Dave Hendrickson, the uh, the the college hockey writer? And so, in that in that area, I I put a huge amount of effort. I was writing features, columns, uh, game stories, mm-hmm. and so I was doing a lot there. I would I wrote humorous pieces. I even. Uh, I even had an appearance in a scientific journal. Uh, those of you who are readers of Alta Frequenza, uh, you can look up a, uh, a scientific uh, um, uh, piece on ionospheric physics that, uh, that has my name on it. So uh, I've done a whole lot of things in the nonfiction area. But uh, I think what the thing that helped me was, first of all, that, that initially gave me an audience when I couldn't get any audience at all for fiction. So that that really helped me out, but it helped me improve my style. And also, because I was writing sometimes humorous pieces, it helped me figure out, okay, what works to make people laugh? You know, the, the one thing that, that you always go and say is that if you write something, you don't want them laughing if it wasn't supposed to be humorous. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's supposed to be humorous, you don't want them just staring at it uh, blindly. So uh, so basically, I really learned about uh, about humor and also emotion. There are certain, there were a lot of pieces that I wrote that had uh, emotion and I I was always attracted to stories that transcended the sport. So for example, um, those who are familiar with Travis Roy, the, uh, the college hockey player who 11 seconds into his career a fluke occurrence and he became a quadriplegic after that. I've, I've written uh, numerous pieces about him and pieces that I was bawling as I was writing them but uh, to my mind, um, learning learning about emotion in writing is something that has carried over into my fiction as well. Mm, yeah, mm. so true. And and of course, you're writing about a character there. And and like you say, the what does separate? Because there's a lot of bots doing sports writing now. But what separates, um, you know, a, a name writer is that kind of emotion, the human mm. story. It's not just rep- you. You weren't just reporting on results, right? You were right. talking about characters and their journey. Um, yep. So that's really interesting. Th- then last question, because basically, you could have just stuck with that. I mean, like you say, you still do a bit of it, but you could have just stuck with that. And you have to start again with writing fiction. You're basically starting at the bottom when you're at the top of another career. So yeah. why do that? And and what are your what's your advice to other people who might feel at whatever point in their life that they're starting again? Yeah, well, I just kept coming back to it because it was why I started writing in the first place. Uh, it was it was what my passion was. It was what my dream was. And so I, I tell people, hold on to your dreams. I mean, I went decades without being able to sell anything, without being able to give it away to a free market. I was just I was just horrible for a really long time. And I was unfortunately I would be working hard, but I would be working hard in the wrong ways. And so I wasn't improving. When I finally got going in the right way, now I'm, I'm not going to say this, this may sound a little bit arrogant, but I, I am kind of proud of the fact that I have a story that is going to be appearing in Best American Mystery Stories 2018, which is an anthology that I've been buying for 20 years and is my number one favorite best of the year anthologies. And I can't believe I'm actually going to be in it. Oh, I've got, congratulations. I've got, <laughs> well, thank you. I've got not one but two stories that are finalists for the Derringer Award that's, that'll be presented at the World Mystery Convention. So for I, I think people who may be wondering, well, is it pointless? Well, I was thinking it was pointless for a pretty long time because writing can be difficult. You know, uh, you, you go and you send out uh, a short story and it comes back with a form, form letter rejection and you just have no way of measuring whether you're getting better or not. Uh, or if you try indie publishing, you indie publish it and you sit there and you wait and uh, you know, mom and your brother and sister buy a copy and, and nothing much happens. And so um, 
if you believe in yourself and if you work in the right way. I think for me where things really took off was when I took on the challenge of writing a story every week and sending it out to a market because up until that point, I would just take one story, one idea, and just grind it into a pulp, uh, just reworking it for, for months and months and months. You don't learn to become a better storyteller by doing that. For me, telling a new story every week and not just shoving it into a drawer, but actually sending it out to a market, to me, that was when things really started taking off. Oh, it's great to hear. I, I really enjoyed talking to you. So tell us where people can find you and your books and everything you do online. Okay. Well, all of my, all of my books and all of my short stories, are, I, I'm wide with everything except for two or three stories that I've got exclusive to, uh, to Amazon. So essentially, I'm wide everywhere. You can get it uh, uh, in, um, <clears throat> you can get print from Amazon, you can get uh, um, print from some other locations, but certainly ebooks anywhere. My website is hendricksonwriter.com, H E N D R I C K S O N, writer. I hope everybody can spell writer.com. <laughs> and if you want to check out uh, the publishing uh, end of things, uh, I'll give you the short version again pentpub.com, P E N T P U B.com, and you can follow my stuff there. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Dave. That was great. Oh, thank you. I, I loved every minute. I really appreciate it, Joanna.